I'd like us to pray as we end into this presentation. And I know that uh, the good Lord is going to bless us as we share in his word. May we humble ourselves to pray as we begin this presentation. Our Father, which in heaven, thank you for your grace and thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies. We pray that uh, your presence may be with us. You continue guiding us. And in this session, Lord, we may get to know you more better and uh, we may put our hopes in thee in everything that we do. And so bless us as we approach uh, your throne and as we sit at thy feet to learn in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I want to thank the Lord, and uh, there is something that uh, I have decided to share with us, and uh, that is uh, facing the future with courage. I had uh, I had earlier named this presentation. I had earlier named this presentation uh, the time of trouble, but now. I changed the title to Facing the Future with uh, Courage. And uh, so I hope that uh, we will be blessed. There's no much change of information, but um, um, there are some things that the Lord has put in my mind to be able to present to the people, to be able to present to the people. And so uh, I like uh, to us to try and see what is happening around the world and see how we can face the future with uh, courage, how we can face the future with courage. We find that um, the world is stirred with the spirit of war. And uh, remember I talked about, let us end into the feast in the previous presentation. But as we enter into the feast and know that the Lord can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, let us try and peep into the future by looking at what is happening in the present. We are told in Christian service, page 54, paragraph 5, and today I'll be quoting more of E.G. White. The world is turned with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the uttermost confusion. War, bloodshed, privation, one, famine, and pestilence were abroad in the land. My attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. Once more, the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me, and again, everything was in the uttermost confusion. Strife, war, and bloodshed with famine and pestilence raged everywhere. Other nations were engaged in this war and confusion. War caused famine, want and bloodshed caused pestilence, and then men's heart failed them for fear, them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. And so everywhere we look around, we see that the world is ripe in the spirit of war. The world is strife, in striving, there is supremacy, there is war, there is pestilence, and there are all these things which are happening. And we are told that um, these are the signs of the time to show that Christ is coming to translate his church. These are just a precursor of what uh, uh, we are going to face in the near future. We can hear the footsteps of the high priest leaving the sanctuary to come and take his people to himself. And so uh, there are a lot of things which are happening, and uh, i like us to see some of them, the forces of evil and their plans. And this is... Uh, I'm reading from the report from Iron Mountain, page 66, page 67, and then go to page 70 to 71. This is uh, a report from the Iron Mountain, the forces of evil. What are their plans? 
And I do not like to talk about what Saturn is doing so much, but it will be good because we are not ignorant of his devices. I want us to read together and see what is happening around us so that we may understand and know how we will face this future with courage. When it comes to postulating a credible substitution for war, the alternate enemy must imply a more immediate, tangible, and directly felt threat of destruction. It must justify the need for taking and paying a blood price in wide areas of human concern. In this respect, the possible substitute enemies noted earlier will be insufficient. One exception might be the environmental pollution model. And uh, when we talk about environmental pollution model, it is what you are seeing people engage in, in what we call the green movement, where actually we have to have zero uh, carbon uh, uh, emission, that uh, we may have a green Sabbath, a day in a week where people can rest from everything so that there may be no pollution in the air and um, the earth may recreate itself from the pollution that is there. And so these people are looking for a solution for these things. And uh, let us look at these things slowly. We are not in a hurry today. Uh, the session may be a little bit longer. We are told that they are looking into these things to see what is a possible uh, solution or a substitute. And so one exception might be, the, might, might be the environmental pollution model. If the danger to society it posed was genuinely imminent, the fictive models would have to carry the weight of extraordinary conviction underscored with a note of inconsiderable actual sacrifice of life. It may be, for instance, that uh, gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal apparent threat to the survival of the species. Poisoning of the air and of the principal sources of food and water supply is already well, is already well advanced. And at first glance will seem promising in this respect. So they are, they are saying that um, if um, we can create a crisis that threatens the environment, the people will be ready to buy into this issue of the green uh, uh, movement of the Green Sabbath. And uh, how can they be able to create a green uh, um, a Sabbath movement? It is by poisoning of the air and poisoning of the principal sources of food and water supply. Everyone will see that now the environment is in danger. And so when they come with the uh, 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 when they come to the people to suggest that let us have a green Sabbath, then uh, it will be easier for people to accept. And those who will reject it will be marked as people who do not want the earth to recreate itself. I, I want you to listen to what the forces of evil are planning and see how we shall come into a problem with them because if they choose a day where they have to rest from this environmental pollution, you are sure that it will not be another day of the week, but the Sabbath. There is a lot of indication that they want this to be on Sabbath day. And so we are going to see what we are going to face in the near future. And so it is true that uh, the rate of pollution could be increased selectively for this purpose. So they are increasing it with their own methods. And by the way, when you talk about these people increasing pollution, by the way they know themselves, and we shall look at it in a little moment, you just have to go to the book of Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 and uh, verses, uh, verses 18, God says this. In verses um, 18, God says, and the nations were angry and thy wrath is come. And the time of the day that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So we have a people who are planning to destroy the earth. And the Lord is saying that judgment shall sit and also they who destroy the earth shall be destroyed. 
let us see how they are continue to continuing to plan this. And so we find this. It is true that the rate of pollution could be increased selectively for this purpose, but the pollution problem has been so widely publicized in recent years that it seems highly improbable that a program of deliberate environmental poisoning could be implemented in a politically, politically acceptable manner. However, unlikely some of the possible alternative enemies we have mentioned may seem, we must emphasize that one must be found of credible quality and magnitude. What will it be that they are really trying to bring forth that uh, will be taken seriously by the people? What is this that uh, they, they are trying to bring about these forces of evil? So that um, when they enact uh, the the when they enact the Green Sabbath uh, day for rest, then uh, uh, then the, the people will readily accept uh, the the thing. Uh, I really request that we mute ourselves so that uh, we may not interfere with the recording. And so what are these things that um, they are um, they, they are suggesting? I, I continued on, it says that um, we must emphasize that one must be found of credible quality and magnitude. If a transition to peace is ever to come about without social disintegration, it is more probable in our judgment that such a threat will have to be invented. So, many of the things that we are seeing happening in this world, these people are planning that uh, uh, these people are um, doing what? What uh, they are doing is um, they want to invent something. They want to invent something. Let us uh, reread again what are their plans. They say, if a transition to peace is ever to come about without social disintegration, it is more probable in our judgment that such a threat will have to be invented. This is a report from the Iron Mountain, page 66 to 67 and 7 to 71. So sometimes we see calamities happening upon this earth but uh, what they are is an invention of man so that they may bring about their agenda. Continued on, this is uh, what uh, we read. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like will fit the bill. Now, I want you to listen to that very carefully. This is New York uh, Pantheon books. Uh, 1991 edition, page 115. So the things that has been are the things that will be, and there's nothing new under the sun. And now the things that they wrote down, they have to do in the end time, we see them being implemented as we speak right now. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like will fit the bill. All these dangers are caused by human intervention. The real enemy then is humanity itself. Alexander King and Bertrand Schneider, the first global revolution, revolution a report by the Council of the Club of Rome, New York Pension Books, 1991, page 115. Continued on, I do not pretend that birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing. So apart from inventing global warming, water shortages, pollution, and farming and the like, they are also working on birth control. Listen to how these forces of evil are planning their things. War, as I remarked a moment ago, this is um, Bertrand and Arthur William Russell, The Impact of Science on Society, New York, Simon and Shasta, 1953, page 103 to 104. We are told that uh, I do not pretend that birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing. 
war, as I remarked, a moment ago has hitherto been disappointing in this respect. So even, even wars, they are invented, but they do not satisfy their bid because they do not end up the way they want them to end. He says, but perhaps bacteriological war may prove more effective. D did you catch that? That um, where all these other things have not been able to fit the bill, they are saying bacteriological war may prove to be more effective. And you see that bacteria are being uh, 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 released in the air and uh, people are dying from these calamities and you wonder what is happening, but there are people in laboratories and planning for this earth and what they are planning and doing behind the scenes is not according to the word of God. If a black death could be spread throughout the world once in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. A scientific world society can not be stable unless there is a world government. It will be necessary to find ways of preventing an increase in the world population. If this is to be done otherwise than by wars, pestilences, and famines, it will demand a powerful international authority. So if they cannot achieve this by war, if they cannot achieve this by pestilence, and if they cannot achieve this by famine, there is something that has to be done which will require a powerful international authority. This authority should deal out the world's food to the various nations in proportion to their population at the time of the establishment of the authority. And so you find that um, there is a rule that a nation should have so such and such a number of the people. And those who will not adhere to these rules, then they will not be funded, they will not receive uh, uh, help from uh, the powerful nations because they are seeking to cut down the population of the world the way they want it. And if the other nations are not going to get along with it, if the governments are not going to get along with it, then they will cut supplies and the aids for those nations. These are very interesting things to read and these are very alarming things, but uh, why are these things coming in the series of the tabernacles? Because the high priest had the pomegranate bells on the hem of his garment. When he went inside the sanctuary, they sounded and the people knew that he's going inside the sanctuary. When he was coming out, they sounded and the people knew that he was coming out of the sanctuary. So the signs of the times in this world are the bells of the high priest on his hem of the garment that we may know something is about to happen in this world. He gave us the signs in Matthew chapter 24. We are given the signs in Daniel chapter 11. We are given the signs in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 13. And this are the bells of the high priest. You can hear the footsteps of the high priest coming from the sanctuary. Continued on, uh, we are told that, um, um, we are told that um, if any nation subsequently increased its population, it should not on that account receive any more food. The motive for not increasing population will therefore be very compelling. Interesting that if a nation just decides we shall increase our population without uh, really uh, uh, talking to the IMF, to the UN, and to, the, to, to this uh, world organization that gives help to the countries, then they will not be supplied with the food. Again, in uh, Jackie's cost to United Nations UNESCO Korea in November of 1991, these are the things that were wrote down years back, but now we are seeing them happening right now. You know, we are told that the enemy plans in time. It is only the Christians who don't plan in time. And how can Christians plan in time? The only way we can plan in time is to be in Christ because we don't know what the enemy is planning. Should we eliminate suffering, diseases? High idea is beautiful, 
but perhaps not a benefit for the long term. We should not allow our, our dread of diseases to endanger the future of our sp species. This is a terrible thing to say. In order to stabilize world population, we must eliminate 35,000 people per day. It is a horrible thing to say, but it is just as bad not to say it. Now, th th these are not uh, conspiracy theories, friends. These are things documented and you can find them in the citations that I'm giving you right now. If you need the slides, I can avail them so that you may go through them slowly. And so they are saying that uh, their plan is to eliminate 350 people per day. It is a horrible thing to say, but it's just as bad not to say. In uh, Edward G. Griffin's The Creature from Jekyll Island, 1994 edition, and uh, I... Uh, I must, I, I must recommend this book to everyone who wants to know the darkness that is happening in this world. Edward G. Griffins has some good things to speak about which aligns with the, what we know is in the Bible. And so I recommend that book uh, by Edward G. Griffins, The Creature from the Jekyll Island. Listen to this from uh, the same author in the same book. He says, the future portrayed as a continuation of present trends, including a hypothetical banking crisis, massive inflation, collapse of the economy, domestic violence, the issuance of new UN money, the arrival of UN peacekeeping forces, and the final merger into the new world order, a form of high-tech feudalism. We are ready now for the final trip in our time machine, on the control panel in front of us are several selector switches. And the selector switches are either wars, famines, pollution, water shortage, or food crisis. These are, you can press any selector on the board and uh, you find what you want. The one on the left indicates direction of time, set it to the future. The switch on the right indicates primary assumptions, set it to the first note, which reads, present trends unaltered. Leave the secondary assumption switch where it is. The lever in the center is a throttle to determine speed of travel. Nudge it forward and hang on tight. Edward G. Griffin's The Creature from Jekyll Islands. It is uh, a very interesting story. You can read the whole thing. Um, and uh, I have an article on uh, the financial crisis and the plan of uh, the evil forces. You can request it. At any time, I'll be able to send it to you. I, I go into details on uh, financial uh, uh, problems that uh, are being created right now in the world so that um, everyone must be depended on the government for survival. In fact, uh, in the land of the free, the USA, they say you will own nothing and you will be happy. That is a scary statement to say. It seems funny, but it's not funny at all. Um, now, Dr. J. H. Kellogg uh, had uh, some things to say about the way these people are acting right now. And uh, I thank the Lord for Seventh-day Adventism, that uh, this church has been given brains, people who think and people whom God have used to see the future and be able to warn the church. While uh, the general conference is playing games, while independent ministry are playing church and while laymen are playing dumb dogs, God had information for this church, which if we get hit, we, we, we hit upon it, we shall be able to be saved from what is coming. Point number one, only the righteousness of Jesus Christ will keep us safe from the time of trouble. Point number two, only doing the will of God by his strength and implementing the things he has told us to implement will save us from a crisis. God, friends, will not do for men what men ought to do. God cannot tell you, take a hoe and go to the garden and plant, and I'll make the plants thrive in the garden. And you say, I have a very good God. I'll just sit in the house, do nothing. The plants will grow on their own and uh, they will plant themselves on their own and grow on their own. No, friends, you are really cheating or deceiving yourself. God says, let us have small lands where we can plant our crops and we shall live like kings and queens. In this crisis of food, he shall make sure that we pass through it. People are strangely saying right now, 
please don't be an alarmist. God will take care of his children. The same God who said, have a small piece of land, have true education, have sanitariums, have your schools, have food factories. The same Lord has told us in advance. And we cannot play ignorance and say the grace of God is sufficient and fold our hands like sluggards and do nothing about it. We need preachers who will speak the truth. We need laymen who can hold, hold, uh, hold on the work. We need shepherds who will not cry peace, peace when there is no peace. And I can assure you there is only peace in obedience to Christ and not peace in ignorance. And so God had foreseen what will happen in the future and uh, uh, giving an eavesdrop into the future. This is um, in 1899 by J.H. Uh, Kellogg. And this is um, the General Conference Daily Bulletin, February 21, 1899. Listen to what God had foreseen and uh, revealed to this man. As I said before, this method of obtaining immunity, and you know what method he's talking about, about um, what we hear the government's imposing on the people, you must go and get a shot and you must go and do this and this. Unless you do that, then uh, you are not part of the hard community and you are not allowed in this office and allowed not in that office. Dr. Kellogg says, as I said before, this method of obtaining immunity against disease is the method of fighting disease with disease, meeting evil with evil. No strange thing should be coming in the body of a Christian. Your body is the temple of God and the Holy Spirit of God abides there. And so it is meeting evil with evil, antidoting poison with poison. It is wonderful to see to what an extent this can be carried. In Chicago, a few weeks ago, a woman appeared before our medical class and she had with her a rattlesnake, which she took out of its cage. She held him in her hand and irritated him. She bit him and stirred him up until he became angry. And then as she bared, uh, bared her arm, she, the reptile struck, struck it time and again and fastened his fangs onto her arm until the flesh was all covered with the virus. Then she said, take that virus and inject it into a mouse and see how quickly it will die. But yet it did not affect her in the least. The fact is she has become so accustomed to the virus of the snake's bite that her body is perfectly immune to it. And it apparently does her no harm whatever. I remember a woman at the sanitarium who in one day took 800 full doses of morphia, enough to kill four men. Apparently, it did not hurt her, though, in fact, it was all the time undermining her constitution. You see that? That her constitution was being undermined, yet she did not uh, uh, get um, uh, uh, to think about this. This method of fighting disease with disease is the human way of meeting disease, just as we fight fire with fire. But God has given us a truth that has in it power to lift a man above the power of disease. He has given us principles which, if we obey and follow, will change our bodies so that we shall not have to be done what? You can read that word. That will lift the body above the power of disease and above the power of sin. So it's not a must. We must receive shots so that we may get uh, to have an immunity that can withstand the disease. These things of forcing uh, 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 foreign substances which are unclean in the bodies of the Christians should not be entertained. And so uh, we are told that will lift the body above the power of disease and above the power of sin, for sin and disease get, go along together. Disease is the consequence of sin and sin induces a moral disease. Now let us continue to hear what uh, he says. That is the very thing I wanted to bring to your mind. We have statistical proof of the fact that this world is soon coming to an end. The Lord is not coming to destroy the world, but to save it. He's coming to save the world from what will come to it if it went on. We are coming down to a time of absolute confusion and destruction. Men are getting more and more subject to disease all the time. There are fewer old people than formerly. The last 50 years, the bottom seems to have dropped out of the constitution of the human race. 
the Lord made man the toughest animal on the face of the earth. Even today, you take a man who is in good training and there is not another beast that can compete with him. A man can travel further in six days than a horse. A well-trained man can tire out two or three horses in the course of a week. There is no question about it. Man, however, has greatly deteriorated, but no other animal will stand the abuse that he endures, even now. How long could a horse or a cow endure such a treatment as humans being give themselves? A man will not dare feed his horse what he himself eats or his cow either. He will not even feed his dog the same. This is the health message and uh, God has given this man a message of what is happening in this time that we are living in. He continues to say, think of that. You see what? The vax is not a thing that is entirely safe, but there is some reason in it. But if you are vaxxed from a calf that has tuberculosis, then you get consumption. So you see that it's not altogether safe. I believe there is something better on principle than that. And I am going to try to show you some disease with disease. And the man who is vaxxed is a little lower in vitality after he has been vaxxed than before. It is like a boy who becomes immune to the use of tobacco. At first, it makes him sick, but afterward, he becomes used to it. And it does not affect him, yet it is doing the boy harm all the time. It is thought by some scientists that this the time will soon come when vaxes will be employed for all maladies in the earth. And we are not talking about time coming. We are in the time when they think that every kind of disease upon the earth have to have a shot. God warned us in 1899. Today we are in 2023. How wonderful is our God who knows the future from the beginning. Look at this. It says, it is thought by some scientists that the time will soon come when vaxes will be employed for all maladies in the earth. It has been said by Dr. Lancaster of London that the time will come when a young man taking a course of medical school would, before he finished, be vaxxed for all diseases that were prevalent in the country. I do not think there will be very much left of that man after he had gone through all that. It has been proved that when a man has had smallpox, he's more subject to consumption than before. I don't know if we are getting what we are reading. And the presentation is facing the future. We are looking at um, facing the future with courage, facing the future with courage. With all these things that I'm reading, how do we face the future with courage? When all these evil forces, they are bent on um, what we have read, spreading the bacteria in the air so that they may reduce at least 350 people per day. And they write it in their journals. We read it, but we still go and make a line that uh, we want to have their um, a health a, a system for ourselves. Let us see how we can face the future with the courage then. Let us see, look at these things. A call to prayer. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 13, and all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children, uh, verse 14, and God spoke to them. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of the Jerusalem and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus said the Lord, and you be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. Continued on on the reflections, Exodus chapter 14, verses 13. And Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptian whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Verse 14, the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. God always fight for his people. God is our defender. The Lord himself is our commander. He is our justifier. 
He is our kinsman redeemer. He is our warrior. He is the Lord who bringeth peace in our hearts. In fact, in John chapter 14, verse 27, we are told that uh, peace I give unto you. My own peace give I, not as the world giveth, I give you my own peace. In John chapter 16, verse 33, we are told that uh, in this world you shall have many tribulations, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. In the famous verse where he is sending out the disciples to preach, this is the last exhortation that he gives unto them in the book of Mark chapter 16. You can open your Bible in the book of Mark chapter 16, the last exhortation that he gives them when he's sending them out. Mark 16, verses 15 to verses 18, a very beautiful verse to me. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. Verse 18, uh, looking at uh, what this world is planning and how God is going to be able to make his children pass through, facing the future with courage. As we see the bells of um, the, as we see the bells of the high priest ringing upon the hem of his garment, this one thing that uh, we, we can rejoice in, that uh, the Lord is on our side, that the Lord is on our side. Yes, in uh, verse 18 of Mark chapter 18, he says, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so if they force you to go and take those things, may the good Lord who has promised in Mark chapter 16, 18, render the poison useless. But it's not our duty to be going to align ourselves to receive the medical care of the world uh, systems. And so there are important things to speak about uh, as we continue looking unto these things, facing the future with courage. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. In Jeremiah, he joins in the chorus in Jeremiah 10, 6. For so much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who will not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appear appertain so much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. In Joshua chapter 9, 1 verse 9, we are told, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, with her, so ever thou goest. When you go to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 8, we are told, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. See, I have this day set thee over nations and over kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. And we understand that the kingdom of God suffereth violence. And it is the violence that takes it. We need the people in the spirit of Elijah. We need the people in the spirit of John the Baptist. The greatest one of the world is the one of men. Who will? Call sin by its rightful name. Men who are as true to the duty as the needle is to the pole. And even if the heavens and the earth fail, this man shall remain. And they shall say, like Mishael, uh, that is Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, that uh, it doesn't concern us a king whether God saves us or not but we will not worship your gods. We need a people who will say that these systems and their, uh, their laws which they are implementing, we shall not bow down to them. Maybe we are waiting for a statue to be put before us with uh, uh, gold all over from the head to the toe, and we are told now, you know what time? It's a time for you to worship, to prostrate before this image. 
This is the kind of the things we are waiting, but that is not what will happen as it were in Daniel chapter uh, uh, two. What uh, uh, in Daniel chapter three, I mean, what we are seeing happening in the world, this bacteriological uh, uh, unleashes, these famines, these wars, and these uh, rules and regulation, these educational systems, and these health systems, these clothing systems, name them, that uh, Babylon has given to the world, somebody must say, I'll not bow down to them. I'll face the future with courage. And I won't put in my body anything that is poisonous for the sake of growing my immunity. Something that has been invented by man, and Dr. Kelo was told, this system of healing disease with disease, this system of healing poison with, fire, with poison, as, as we do uh, uh, the, 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 the fire with fire, it is not of God, but it is sin. This was what God showed him. We are seeing the plans that they made on the Jekyll Island and uh, Roan Mountain. And uh, the, the plans they had, they are now executing them, the inflation, the recession, the uh, the controlling of the markets. And we are just playing along as if we do not know what is happening. And uh, we try to save ourselves from these things. And God says that whoever shall try to save himself shall lose his life, but whoever loses his life shall get it. It is better, he says, you enter into the kingdom of God maimed and be saved than enter with the whole body and be destroyed. It is a time we, can be, we became serious with God. Because Jesus Christ dying on Calvary was not a joke. It was a serious thing that he left heaven and everything that was in heaven and came and died for us. But we will take Christianity as just a simple thing and uh, move along as if things were simple as that. But uh, brethren and sisters, it's a time we got serious. It's a time that we lay our life on the line and uh, accept martyrdom. In fact, when the fifth seal was opened, those who were slain for the word of God, they asked the Lord, uh, O God of uh, judgment, when shall thou revenge us of our blood? And he told, he, they were given white robes and they you were told that rest for a little while until your brethren are killed the same way you were killed. But when we hear about killing, when we hear about losing life because we are standing for God, we say, no, 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 no. Th that cannot be. Let us try out something. But when you come to losing life because you stand for God, please don't go to that extreme. And so it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous Christianity we are trying to have, actually. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 41, verses 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I'll strengthen thee. Yeah, I'll help thee. Yeah, I'll uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We have nothing to fear when we fear the God of heaven and earth. Uh, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, we are told, And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of the people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen the, there was a nation. Even to that same time, and at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So when, 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 you, when you're looking at Revelation chapter 13, and the whole world is wandering after the beast, ask yourself, will I be part of the whole world? Or will I be part of those whose names are written in the book, uh, Lamb Book of Life? Now, we are told that uh, we should not be presumptuous and we should not uh, be boasting that my name is in the book of life because you don't know even. Um, but we can be sure of one thing. Christ says, whoever doeth my will, him will I not cast out. He has promised that. And knowing his will is not difficult. It is just to rely on him to tell you what to do. To the law and to the prophet, if they do not speak according to this word, there is no light in them. So you have just to tell the Lord, give me the strength to do what you have said in your word. And please give me the strength to be able to shun that which is not in your word. As simple as that. And the Lord himself will take care of the rest. Because in Philippians 1.6, he says that uh, 
he who has started a good work in you will accomplish it unto the day of the Lord. So we need not to be unsure of our salvation because just men tell us, oh, if you are sure of your salvation, then you are bragging and boasting that uh, you are saved and you know that uh, that is bad. No, that is not boasting. That is not pride. It is trusting the Lord that he will do what he has promised he will do. In fact, that is faith, trusting the Lord that he will do what he will do. That is not pride. That is not boasting. And so there shall be a time of trouble in Revelation chapter 3, verses 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And um, in Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of, of Christ. And now we, we, we are not just talking about the 10 precepts. The 10 precepts are a summary of the whole totality of the Bible. Some people think that we have only 10 precepts, which we, we have to look into and revere it and make sure that we are checklisting ourselves if uh, we are in sync with the, those 10 precepts. No, brethren, the 10 commandments are a summary of the whole Bible. And the whole Bible stands on two principles. Thou shalt love God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul. And the second is unto like the first one, thou shalt love thy neighbor as you love thy, thyself. This is what the law and the prophet stand on. This is the rule of life. So if you take Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, we only have two commandments that summarize the whole Bible, or you come up with only 10 precepts that summarizes Genesis 1 to Revelation chapter 22. Love God and love your neighbor. That is the whole duty of man. And in fact, Paul tells us, O oh man, nothing but the debt of love. And we are told that without that, we shall not see the face of God because that is what his government is built upon, the principle of love and the principle of self-sacrifice. And so um, we can face the future with um, certainty. Uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, we are told, and he exercised all the power of the past beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed, Revelation 13, 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of these miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell upon the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by sword and lead, live. Now, it is interesting to see how the the second beast will give life to the first beast. And uh, I wish um, I had this already in my notes so that uh, I may share with you people. Uh, it is so interesting to look at these things, how they are happening, how the first beast uh, will give um, life to the image of uh, the beast. And uh, I, I want us to read something. I want us to read something and it's incredible how they are, they are planning to do all these things. A system of uh, Babylon, Babylonian festivities, and uh, all that uh, he is planning to do to the people, a system of uh, Babylonian festivities. Now, I want you to see this. I want you to see what uh, actually we are trying to tackle, facing the future with courage. But the, 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 the powers of evil are um, trying to set up some things. Now, we, we, we read this, 
and I'll just go back to this. In um, we are told in Revelation 13, 12, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell thereon to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed and deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by sword and he did and did live. Now, look at this. I, I, I'd like to show you something. You know, sometimes we talk about uh, how the USA will be able to make up these things, but we don't go into details how this thing is. I want you to have some patience because this is going to be interesting. This question was then as it always has been, very far reaching. When the right was claimed to worship according to the dictates of conscience, in that was claimed the right to disregard all the Roman laws of the subject of religion and to de deny the right of the state to have anything whatsoever to do with the question of religion. But this, according to the Roman estimate, was only to be defiance to the state and to the interest of society altogether. The Roman state, so intimately and intricately connected with religion, was but the reflection of the character of the Roman people, who prided themselves upon being the most religious of all nations. And Cicero commended them for this because their religion was carried into all the details of life. The Roman ceremonial worship, was very elaborate and minute, applying to every part of daily life. It consisted in sacrifices, prayers, festivals, and the investigations by augurs and haruspices of the will of the gods and the cause of future events. Look at this. The Romans counted, accounted themselves an exceedingly religious people because their religion was so intimately connected with the affairs of home and state. Thus, religion everywhere met the public life of the Roman by its festivals and laid an equal yoke on his private life by its requisition of sacrifices, prayers, and aquarists. All pursuits must be conducted according to a system carefully laid down by the College of Pontiffs. If a man went out to walk, there was a form to be recited. If he mounted his chariot, another. But this whole system of religion was false. We are now talking about the dark ages when the Roman power uh, persecuted Christians. And we are being told that there shall be a second beast rising to give life to the first beast and to speak like the first beast. So this is how the Roman beast spoke in the days of uh, dark ages. And soon we shall see how it will speak. Uh, the, the second beast will speak so as to give life to the first beast. But this whole system of religion was false. The gods which they worshipped were false gods. Their gods, in short, were but reflections of themselves. And the ceremonies of worship were but the exercise of their own passion and lust. Neither in their gods nor their worship was there a single element of good. Therefore, upon it, all Christianity taught the people to turn their backs. The Christian doctrine declared all these gods to be no gods and all the forms of worship of the gods to be only adultery and a denial of the only true God, the God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Alonso, Trevor, Jonas, the two Republicans or the two Romes that I'm reading from. If you are wondering what is TTR and what is ATJ, Alonso, Trevor, Jonas, the two Romes or the two Babylons. Look, the games and the, all the festival dates were affairs of the state and were an essential part of the cheerful devotion of the pagans and the gods who were supposed to accept as the most grateful offering. The games that the prince and the people celebrated in honor of their peculiar festivals. And uh, I, I'll pass over this and uh, got something. We read. The festivities of the wedding and the ceremonies of the funeral were all conducted under the protection of the gods. More than this, the number of the gods was as great as the number of the incidents in earthly life. Momsen, page seven. The pagans' domestic heart was guarded by the penates or the ancestral gods of his family or tribe. 
By land, he traveled under the protection of one tutelar divinity, by sea of another, the birth, the bridal, the funeral had each its presiding deity. The very communist household utensils and implements were cast in mythological forms. He could scarcely drink without being reminded of making a libation to the gods. This is uh, Milman. All this heat and ceremony Christianity taught the people to renown, and everyone did renown it who became a Christian. But so intricately was the adultery interwoven into all the associations of both public and private life of both state and social action that it seemed impossible to escape the observance of them without at the same time renouncing the commerce of mankind and all the offices and amusement of society. Yet with any of it, true Christianity did not comprise. So every Christian merely by the profession of uh, Christianity served himself from all the gods of Rome and everything that was done in their honor. He could not attend a wedding or a funeral of his nearest relative because every ceremony was performed with reference to the gods. He could not attend the public festival for the same reason. But avoiding attending all this, all this subjected the Christian to universal hatred. If you did not attend these ceremonies, if you did not do your worship according to their dictates, if you did not do your weddings according to their dictate, you were subjected to universal hatred. And this was the source of the persecution of Christianity by pagan Rome. So they took all this paganism, brought them as a form of lifestyle, and then took the state to enforce them. And everyone who did not play along with that, they were subjected to universal hatred. And then what followed was persecution. And now, when uh, papal Rome came into the scene, we are talking about pagan Rome. It took all the festivals that they dedicated to their gods and they enforced to the people and those who will not practice them, they were hated. When papal Rome came, it took all that was of pagan Rome, baptized it and gave it what we call Christianity and incorporated in all the forms of paganism, and then they force the people in dark ages to live according to that lifestyle. And if you refused, then you are persecuted. I want to read you a story of what happened in those times. And we are looking at how will the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 speak like the first beast of Revelation chapter 13? How will the second beast give life to the first beast? In the book of, uh, uh, in reading, in continuing to read, uh, this is uh, uh, Amos, and uh, I just uh, like to bring some point here. There is um, Alonzo Trevor John Jones. And uh, this is the American Sentinel that uh, we are going to read right now. Um, this is American Sentinel by Etty Jones. He talks about papal Rome taking paganism and baptizing it with Christianity. He goes ahead to say, the reign of spiritual and emotional tyranny in dark ages and the Sunday laws of the 17th century. We have not to go back very far into the past to find the information sought, nor are we obliged to turn to Roman Catholic lands. Indeed, those most active in national reform work are the descendants of the old Scottish co covenanters. And it is the Scottish Covenanter theory of government which they are seeking to establish in this country, that is USA. That theory was once well established in Scotland and every interesting to enlighten people in this age is the record of the proceeding under it. That record may be found in Buckle's history of civilization. First, however, by way of introduction, we quote the following from the Encyclopedia Britannica article, Presbyterianism. For the spiritual tyranny which they, the Covenanters, introduced, the reader should refer to Mr. Buckle's famous chapter or 
if he thinks those statements to be partial or exaggerated to original records such as those of the Presbyterian of St. Andrews and Cooper, the arrogance of the minister's pretensions and the readiness with which these pretensions were granted, the appealing conceptions of the date which were inculcated, and the absence of all contrary expression of opinion, the intrusions of the domain of the magistrate, the vexations, interference in every detail of family and commercial life, and the patience with which it was born are to an English reader alike amazing. We acknowledge, said they, that according to the latitude of the word of God, which is our theme, we are allowed to treat in an ecclesiastical way of greatest and smallest, from the king's throne that should be established in righteousness to the merchant's balance that should be used in faithfulness. The liberality of the interpretation given to this can only be judged after a minute reading. So what do we read? Turning now to Buckle's famous chapter, chapter five of his history of civilization, we found the following. According to the Presbyterian polity, which reached its height in the 17th century, the clergyman of the parish selected a certain number of laymen on whom he could depend and who under the name of elders were his counselors, or rather the ministers of his authority. They, when assembled together, formed what was called the CAC session. And this little court, which enforced the decisions uttered in the pulpit, was so supported by the superstitious reverence of the people that it was far more powerful than any civil tribunal. By its aid, the minister became supreme, for whoever presumed, presumed to disobey him was excommunicated, was deprived of his property, and was believed to have incurred the penalty of eternal perdition. The clergy interfered with every man's private concerns, ordered how he should govern his family, and often took upon themselves the personal control of his household. Clarendon under the year 1640 emphatically says, the preacher reprehended the husband, governed the wife, chastised the children, and insulted over the servants in the houses of the greatest men, not 26. Their minions, their elders, were everywhere, for each parish was divided into several quarters, and to each quarter one of these officials was allotted, in order that he might take special notice of what was done in his own, own district. Besides this, spies were appointed, so that nothing could escape their supervision. Sunday observance was enforced in a manner which to even the strictest national reformer would have been unexceptionable. The preacher was exalted to a position which in the public mind must have been but little short of the place of deity. These are dark ages we are reading and we are reading in what is going to happen in USA and other nations in the near future. To him, the minister, all must listen and him all must obey. Without the consent of his tribunal, tribunal, no person might engage himself either as a domestic servant or a field laborer. If anyone incurred the displeasure of the clergy, they did not scruple to summon his servants and force them to state whatever they know respecting him and whatever they had seen done in his house. To speak disrespectfully of a preacher was a grievous offense. To differ from him was a heresy, even to pass him in the streets without saluting him was punished as a crime. His very name was regarded as sacred and not to be taken in vain. That is actually a blasphemy on the third commandment. I won't speak on that more. And that it might be properly protected and held in due honor, an assembly of the church in 1642 forbade it to be used in any public paper unless the consent of the holy man had been previously obtained. Very interesting. The arbitrary and irresponsible trib tribunals, which now sprang up all over the Scotland, united the executive authority with the legislature and exercised both functions at the same time, declaring that certain acts ought not to be committed. They took the law into their own hands and punished those who had committed them. According to the principles of this new jurisprudence, of which the clergy was, were the authors, it became a sin for any Scotchman to travel in a Catholic country. It was sin for any Scotch innkeeper to admit a Catholic into his inn. It was a sin for any Scotch town to hold a market either on Saturday or on Sunday 
because both days were near Sunday. Take that seriously. That when this Sunday law comes, it will be prohibited to hold any market either on Saturday or on Monday because both days, that is Saturday and Monday, are near Sunday and Sunday is sacred. It was a sin for a Scotch woman to wait at a tavern. It was a sin for her to live alone. It was also sin for her to live with unmarried sisters. Now, we were talking about this in our Sabbath school and it was a serious thing. This simply means you cannot be single as a lady and you cannot live with single sisters. You have to be married. Read it again. It's not my own word. It was sin for a Scotch woman to wait at a tavern. It was sin for her to live alone. It was also a sin for her to live with unmarried sisters. What does that imply? You know, sometimes we talk about Sunday laws and uh, in Testimonies, Volume 6, uh, uh, vol Testimonies, Volume 6, page 17, it says that uh, the light we have received upon the mark of the third angel is the true light. The mark of the beast is what it has been said it is, but more on this issue has not been known until the unrolling of the scroll, but a solemn work is before us to do. So much about Sunday has not been revealed to us, but we can just peep into it by looking at what happened in dark ages and such a things were happening. It was um, seen to go from one town to another on Sunday, however pressing the business might be, it was a sin to visit your friend on Sunday. On that day, whose exercise was sinful, so was walking in the fields or in the meadows or in the streets or enjoying the fine weather by sitting at the door. So you cannot even bask the sun on Sunday. It is seen because it is the Sunday Sabbath. And it is basking at your own house. Remember, not at any place. It is seen. To go to sleep on Sunday before the duties of the day were over, that is the uh, uh, religious services, was also sinful and deserved church censor. The records of the CAC session of Aberdeen in 1656 have this entry cited by Lobel Balford, servant to William Gordon Taylor, being found sleeping on the Lord's side on the Lord's day in time of summer. And so at the CAC, the prayers were averagely two hours in length. You will forgive me for presenting this presentation for almost one hour and 20 minutes. At the CAC, the prayers averaged nearly two hours in length. People just praying. And what were they praying about? you will wonder. And the sermons was about three hours and a half. So somebody's just speaking three and a half hours and it is something which is not interesting. Yet it was a great sin even for the children to become tired before they were ended. So Halibaton addressing the young people of his congregation says, have not you been glad when the Lord's day was over, that is Sunday, or at least when the preaching was done that you might get your liberty? Has it not been a burden to you to sit so long in the church? Well, this is a great sin. Heresy or pretended liberty of conscience was the crime of crimes and to be punished accordingly. They taught that it was sin to tolerate his, the heretic's notions at all, and that the proper course was to visit him with sharp and immediate punishment. Going yet further, they broke the domestic ties and set parents against their offspring. They taught the father to smite the unbelieving child and to slay his own boy sooner than to allow him to propagate error. So if your boy came at home and he said, you see father or mother, I have some an idea that I have read in the Bible and now I understand it, I would like to share. If it was not according to the Catholic doctrine or the Scotch doctrine, you as a father, you had a duty to slay your own child so that that error must not be propagated. We are talking about Sunday law in the 16th century. And Sunday law will come very soon. As if this were not enough, let us read this story. They tried to extirpate another faction, even more sacred and more devoted to, still. They laid their rude and merciless hands on the holiest passion of which our nature is capable the love of a mother for her son. Into that sanctuary they dared to intrude, into that they thrust their grand and ungentle forms. If a mother held opinions of which they disapproved, they did not scruple to invade her household, take away her children, 
and forbid her to hold communication with them. Just today, like you can decide, my children are not going to get a vax. They will come to your house, take your children, and you will never see them again. When these laws are implemented, this world will be plunged in darkness more than has ever been there in 16th century. We are told that there will be tribulations more than it has there has ever been a nation. So, or if perchance her son had incurred their displeasure, they were not satisfied with possible separation, but they labored to corrupt her heart and harden it against her child so that she might be privy to the act. In one of these cases mentioned in the records of the Church of Glasgow, the cack session of that town summoned before them a woman, merely because she had received into her own house her own son after the clergy had excommunicated him. So effectually did they work upon her mind that they induced her to promise not only that she would shut her door against the child, but that she would aid in bringing him to punishment. She had sinned in loving him. She had sinned even in giving him shelter, but says the record, she promised not to do it again and to tell the magistrates when he comes next uh, to her. She promised not to do it again. She promised to forget him whom she had born of her womb and suckled at her breast. She promised to forget her boy, who had oftentimes crept to her knees and had slept in her bosom, and whose tender frame she had watched over and nursed to hear of such a thing is enough to make one's blood surge again and raise a tempest in our inmost nature. But to have seen them, to have lived in the midst of them, and yet not to have rebelled against them is to us utterly inconceivable and proves in how complete a thraldom the scorch was held and how thoroughly their minds and well as their bodies were enslaved. What more need I say? What further evidence need I to bring to elucidate the real character of one of the most detestable tyrannies ever seen on the earth? When the scorch cock was at the height of its power, we may search history in vain for any institution which can compete with it, except the Spanish Inquisition by the Catholics. Between these two, there is a close and intimate analogy. Both were intolerant, both were cruel, both made war upon the finest part of the human nature, and both destroyed every vestige of religious freedom. Now listen to what Etijone says. It may be said, of course, that all this was back in the 17th century when men were narrow and bigoted in their ideas and intolerant in matters of religion. Yes, that was the 17th century when men were bigoted and self-opinionated and revengeful and hated others who differed from them and lusted for power in both civil and spiritual affairs. And this is the 19th, or we can say the 24th century, when human nature is exactly the same as it was then. Today, men are narrow-minded, begotted, full of prejudices and passions, and as eager to obtain power and to use it for any purpose they may see fit as they ever were in the past. Let the National Reform Party succeed. That is the Protestants uniting with the state. Let there be a resurrection of the Scottish Covenanta or the Spanish Inquisition theory of government in this land of USA, and there will be a chapter in our national history parallel to that in Scotland history to which we have referred above. Now, when you hear such a things, brethren, what did you think about? Let us finish this presentation. Let us finish at least. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. When USA will enact the Sunday laws and the Protestant unite with the state to form the laws to govern mankind, you will see more than what you have read in the CAC session and the Spanish Inquisition. And this Protestant breathing fire and their false miracles going before them, we are told that Satan himself will be turned into an angel of life and the institutions of the church will respect him. We can see that happening in, our, in, 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 in this land. In 4SP 277.2 we read, when the churches of our land uniting upon such a points of faith as are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institution, then will protest and America have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy. 
as the Sabbath has become the special point of controversy throughout the Christendom and religious and secular authorities have, secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday, the persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal uh, execration. It will be urged that the few who stand in the opposition to an institution of the church and law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it be better for them to suffer than for whole nation to be thrown into confusion of lawlessness. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as will not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and born, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark of the name, had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. So let us look at this. I'll skip over this. What is this conflict we are entering on? I'll read this uh, four slides and then uh, we end. What is the conflict we are entering in? The dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keepeth the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are the traditions of men more worthy of faith than the gospel of our Savior? Replied Jerome, Paul did not exhort those to whom he wrote to listen to the traditions of men, but said such the scriptures. Uh, this is Great Controversy 114, paragraph 6. We shall come. We shall call upon our churches in the name of the Lord to view the struggle in its true light. It is a contest between the Christianity of the Old and New Testament and the Christianity of human tradition and corrupt fables. This is the war we are entering in when the uh, second beast gives the life to the image of the beast. That is the first beast. There are many at the present day thus clinging to the customs and traditions of their fathers. When the Lord sends them additional light, they refuse to accept it because not having been granted to their fathers, it was not received by them. We are not to place where our we are not placed where our fathers were. Consequently, our duties and responsibilities are not the same as theirs. We shall not be approved of God in looking to the example of our fathers to determine our duty instead of searching the word of truth for ourselves. Our responsibility is greater than was that of our ancestors. We are accountable for the light which they received and which was handed down as an inheritance for us. And we are accountable also for the additional light which is now shining upon us from the word of God. Between the laws of men and the precepts of Jehovah will come the last great conflict of the great controversy between truth and error. Upon this battle we are now entering, a battle not between rival churches contending for the supremacy, but between the religion of the Bible and the religions of fables and traditions. The substitution of the precepts of men for the commandments of God has not ceased. Even among Christians are found institutions and usages that have no better foundation than the traditions of the fathers. Such institutions resting upon mere human authority have supplanted those of divine appointment. Men cling to their traditions and revere their custom and cherish hatred against those who seek to show them their error. In this day, when we are bidden to call attention to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, we see the same enmity as was manifested in the days of Christ. Of the remnant people of God, it's written, the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Our triumphal uh, our triumph at last, we are told, and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And when came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto the unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Lastly, facing the future with courage, which is the title of our presentation. In reviewing our past history, 
having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say praise God. As I see what the Lord has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. May the Lord bless us. May we think about the things we have read. Are we to fear of the future? He says, when you pass through the waters, I'll be there. When you pass through the fire, I'll be there. And he says that uh, your bread and your water shall be sure in Isaiah 33 verse 16. Let us be encouraged to stand strong in the Lord, whether the heavens or the earth fall. We can face the future with courage, seeing that Christ has triumphed. His victory is our victory. Shall we be able to uh, thank God in prayer? Shall we be able to thank God in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, as we see all these things that uh, the enemy is planning, I am so glad that Christ has a better plan to give us his righteousness. And that is what I'm concerned about. And so, Father, help all of us to place ourselves at a place where we shall be ministered by your angels, your spirit, and all the heavenly hosts. Thank you so much because we have a bright future. And though afflictions of this world may continue for a short time, eternal bliss waits for thy people. And so thank you because you will give us the courage to face the future. In Jesus' name, amen.